With us today, we have Lisa Marshall, who's Director of Outreach, Retention, Engagement, and Assistant Extension Ex uh, Professor and Advisor in the Department of Nuclear Engineering at NC State. Would you stand up, Lisa? And she's here for obvious reasons for this discussion. She was, Lisa was recently named Vice President and President-Elect of the American Nuclear Society. So it's quite a recognition. We appreciate her coming today. Okay. Um, I'm going to I'm about to introduce Carol Bloom, who's the uh, chair of the environmental uh, roundtable, who's sp uh, sponsoring this session. And she'll introduce our speaker. I want to remind you during the course of the speech, if you would, uh, you know, frame any questions that you have. Uh, we'll have a question and answer uh, answer session uh, toward the end, uh, and what, uh, Mary Coyne and myself will be coming with. Uh, microphone. So just put your hand up when you know when you have a question, and uh, wait for the microphone to come before you, uh, you know, announce your question. So now, Carol, would you? Uh, oh, hello, everyone. I'm so glad to see each of you here today. Now, can you hear me? Okay. Down. Okay. <laughs> um, I'd love to ask each of you, uh, what is your interest in nuclear energy and why did you come to our program today? But I can answer the question, why is the Environment Roundtable hosting this particular luncheon with this particular topic? The National League of Women Voters publishes a guide to its public policy positions. And one of those policy statements is, quote, the League believes that climate change is a serious threat facing our nation and our planet. Another statement is, quote, the League's aim is to work for citizen participation in the decision-making process at all levels of government. So to do that, we start with education, and that is what our roundtables do. First, we take time to study an issue do our research, talk about it, have experts come and talk to us so that we are as educated as possible, and then we share that with the wider community. So the damage from the changing climate is experienced right now across the world, and the urgency to transition away from carbon-producing fossil fuels that heat the planet this urgency is recognized by governments across the world, including, of course, the United States. And in the United States, 30 states and D.C. have set standards to both conserve energy use and to transition away from energy sources that produce greenhouse gases. This is an enormous challenge. Can humans meet it in time? Closer to home, the city of Greensboro has a strategic energy plan. The Guilford County Schools has an energy plan. The state of North Carolina has a clean energy plan. So there is an urgency globally and right here to develop and finance sources of energy called renewable or clean. And one of these is nuclear energy, meaning it does not emit carbon when it is up and running and producing energy. Nuclear energy has been very controversial in the past, and the industry itself has lessons to learn. So what is different now? Our electric, our electric utility wants to build more nuclear reactors in North Carolina. So that is one of the reasons we have invited Dr. John Zeno to further our education about a newer nuclear technology being developed right here in our state and also so that we as educated citizens can participate in the decision-making process at all levels of government. John Zeno holds a faculty appointment with the Department of Nuclear Engineering at North Carolina State University as an associate teaching professor and is also the chief consulting engineer for advanced plant technology at GE Hitachi Nuclear Energy in Wilmington, North Carolina. 
John has worked in the nuclear industry for 38 years in a variety of engineering and technical leadership roles, including, well, I stopped there because there is so much to say about him. And that's why I put the sheet on your table so you can read a lot more about him. So John, welcome. We're so glad to have you today. Okay, all right, I've, I've been told I have to put this very close to my mouth to work, so let me know, oh, volume okay, good. All right, give me one moment, we're gonna go and launch the slide deck, uh, but while I'm doing that, I'm gonna kind of walk over here. Um, would it be okay if we could take questions as I'm speaking and showing the slides? Uh, because I have found uh, when I do public speaking or even in teaching, it does help to be able to sort of interact with the, the folks in the, in the audience in the crowd. And if maybe you can give them a microphone where we can pass it around, that would be great. Well, thank, first of all, thank you for coming out. Um, really do appreciate the opportunity to come and speak uh, with the group today. Um, we're going to try to walk through some of the content that I have. And I really do want to make this, um, I, I don't want to stand up here and lecture for 60 minutes. I really don't. Uh, and I'm pretty sure you don't want me to do that either. I, I would really prefer if we could just kind of talk together, back and forth a little bit, about some of the things that w we want to discuss today. And so I actually put together our little game plan here. Here's, our, here's, here's the game plan strategy for today. Um, from an agenda standpoint, I'm going to try to keep the um, content um, linear in that we're going to look at nuclear energy, and we're going to look at um, a couple of important things in the past um, that have uh, been historical events that took place in the industry and its development. We'll talk a little bit about the, the, the present state of nuclear energy and what it looks like today in the Southeast and in North Carolina. And then we'll talk a little bit about the future as well, because I know that's something that a lot of folks are interested in. Um, and as I said, we're going we're gonna, to, the format is we're going to pretty much just take questions as we go. Um, so that we can engage and discuss with one another. So really and truly, please do not hesitate to ask a question. You're not gonna throw my timing off. You're not going to you know, cause me to stumble. I, I do this all the time and I'm perfect. In fact, I prefer this method um, because it actually helps everyone, including me, remember what we've, what we've discussed, what we've talked about, rather than just give you cold, sterile facts that you'll forget five minutes after you leave here, um, it's much better to, to be able to relate what you're hearing to things you already know about um, so that you have like a mental hook. And, and you'll actually be able to remember things better in that way. So a, a dialogue is a great way to facilitate that. So hopefully it'll keep you from falling asleep. And, um, and uh, what I found is it's actually a lot of fun. It's a lot more fun to do it this way. So, okay, let me see. Yep, there I am. Okay, let me get my water bottle. So I hesitated to even just to think about putting a slide up here, but I figured if you're going to have a discussion with me for the next 60 minutes, it's probably good to at least know a little bit about the person you're talking with. So, um, so yes, that is me um, in 1986. I'm going to say 35 years and 45 pounds ago. That was me graduating from NC State um, in the nuclear engineering program. On the right is me a couple of years ago. Um, when I came back as a faculty member to teach, as a part-time faculty member, so really, really fortunate and very blessed to be able to come back to the program that I started with many years ago. Um, you may not know this, I don't know how many of you know this, but NC State really has a very, very well-recognized and outstanding program. And I'm not just saying that because I'm an alumni and, a, and an instructor. In fact, despite me being an alumni and an instructor, they actually have the third, they're actually right third in the country for nuclear engineering. It's one of the highest ranked programs in the United States. Um, and it really has a tremendous legacy. And you can see on the left, um, in the early 1950s, it was actually one of the first universities in the country, actually the first to have a, a nuclear program, a nuclear curriculum. Um, one of the first to have a little test reactor on campus. That kind of surprises people when, they, when I say that sometimes. They still have one today that they've been operating safely for decades. Great research tool, um, great recruiting tool. So there's a lot of history with nuclear energy in the state of North Carolina that I think is really important to keep in mind. 
Um, one thing I will mention very quickly, because I keep my eye on the clock here, is um, we're only going to focus today's discussion on energy, nuclear energy, or nuclear power. There are many other elements of nuclear technology that, um, that we could talk about that we're not going to have time to discuss. Um, there are numerous areas of nuclear medicine, um, radiation nuclear therapy that are used today in society. Nuclear has a tremendous impact in many aspects of our life. Um, uh, the defense and military sector uses nuclear technology all the time. If any of you are familiar with the U.S. Navy, you would probably know that the Navy has a very, very strong presence with nuclear, with nuclear energy. So we're going to focus on just energy today, but be aware that there's a lot of things that go, uh, that go along with this um, that are very positive contributors to society, um, and nuclear energy certainly you know, being one of them. Okay, so we're going to start with the past. And so for some of you, this may be an interesting kind of stroll down memory lane. Um, I will tell you the students that I talk to find this fascinating. I actually do myself because I'm a little bit of a history buff. Um, so we're going to go through just a quick little highlight of like a timeline of some of the major, major uh, high watermark events that started the nuclear industry. I don't want to spend a lot of time on this because um, the, the goal today is to talk about like the present and the future. But I don't think you can really do that without at least talking a little bit about the past. So you can have a, you can contextualize it and put it in, re in a frame of reference. Um, so there were a number of key um, members of the scientific community in the 1920s and 30s who um, noticed that there were some interesting aspects of this very particular substance called uranium that um, had properties that were had previously not really been known or understood very well. And one of them was this idea that uh, this isotope, this element, could actually split and release energy. It's, it's the process is known as fission, and we'll, we'll, we'll talk about nuclear fission in a minute. Um, and so Leo Szilard was one of the first ones to do that, um, working with Albert Einstein, very familiar name from the past, um, and recognized the potential for this very interesting element to maybe be useful for producing energy, um, or for a number of other types of applications. And in the 30s, really the mid to late 30s, leading up to World War II, leading up to the US's entrance into World War II, there was significant work going on, both in Europe and in the United States, um, that was leading to the discovery of how to utilize um, this uranium atom, um, either for uh, energy production or for military application. And again, keeping in mind the historical context, um, there was a lot of interest in this, in this element. And so these are some very, very well-known names in the, in the nuclear industry. Uh, Niels Bohr, uh, Lisa Meitner, uh, Enrico Fermi in, in Italy and Rome in the 1930s. There were a number of scientific groups all around the world studying these areas, but none of them were really, had never really brought, been brought together to try to understand what way they were seeing and observing. Um, in, um, in 1938, two German chemists, um, uh, Otto Frisch and, um, uh, and um, uh, Strassmann, uh, no, I'm sorry, Otto Hahn and Fritz Strassmann, um, had discovered the process of nuclear fission while working in the lab. Now, they were German chemists. So you can kind of imagine what the thinking was back in 1938 when Hahn and Strassmann discovered this. This, this began to be a bit of a concern for folks in, um, in the Western society, in the Western world, that perhaps the Nazis would get their hands on this technology and perhaps be able to do something that could be very devastating. And so when this was discovered, this was really the start of pulling together what we now know today as the Manhattan Project, um, where scientists that were fleeing Europe in the 1930s, many of them fleeing Germany and other Eastern European countries, came to the US um, and actually began to work on what we now know today as the Manhattan Project. Many of them came to Columbia University in New York, hence the, hence the Manhattan Project, but there were a number of areas where this research was being conducted in the US, and one was at the University of Chicago, 
actually under the football stadium, um, Enrico Fermi uh, and, and a number of his scientists who had come over from, from Europe um, to escape fascism that was taking over Europe at that time, um, put together uh, the first artificial man-made nuclear reactor by assembling graphite blocks with uranium spheres um, and putting them in a certain way where that fission reaction could actually sustain itself, meaning as the fission process started and neutrons were released, that they would cause fission in other uranium atoms and the process could actually sustain itself. It was a self, what's known as a self-sustained chain reaction. And this was the first time it had been really demonstrated or proven. Um, and this was one of the key factors. This is what led to the development of what we now know today as nuclear power technology, also nuclear weapons as well, because it uses the same process um, that you see in, in both of those applications. Um, <clears throat> obviously, you know the outcome of the World War II and what happened with the atomic bomb program um, and the ultimate end result of the Manhattan Project. But after the war had ended, um, many individuals recognized the significance of this technology for peaceful, peacetime, useful applications, particularly for energy production. And so if the same source that could be used to make a device that could explode, perhaps we could put it together in a way that could be safely used to operate and produce electric power. Um, and that's exactly what was, what was occurring in 1946. The Atomic Energy was commissioned, established and foster, to foster and control the peacetime development of science and technology, nuclear science and technology. And that was really the start, I think many would point to as the start of the nuclear power or nuclear energy industry. Okay, now don't, don't forget to stop me if you have a question, okay? I want to make sure. Want, yes, please, there you go. See, I knew I would get somebody to buy if I put the hook out there long enough. I have Oppenheimer yes. on my mind. Yes. Um, Yeah, good question. So at the beginning, I said we're going to focus on nuclear energy and nuclear power production. So Oppenheimer was the one who led the project for the atomic bomb. So we're not going to talk about weapons. We're not going to talk about bombs blowing up. We can talk about that afterwards. would love to talk to anyone about that. But we're going to focus on nuclear energy um, and not the weapons or military production side of it. But yes, he was obviously... Who, who here saw the movie? I'm just curious. Yeah, it wasn't a great movie. Really loved it. So yes, that's all part of the history of the industry. Um, but but yeah, we're going to try to focus on the energy part. Yeah, we have a question here. Even starting at this point, my question is, who is driving? Is it the government interested in harnessing energy, or is it commercial people thinking I can make a buck from this? So initially, it's the government, and then but eventually, when people realize that hey we can actually produce electric power with this, then commercial companies started getting interested. Because it, it obviously, and we'll, we'll talk about it in a minute, um, there's a tremendous amount of energy stored up in, the, in this uranium atom, these nuclear fuels, and I'll show an example here, sort of an illustration. There's a tremendous amount of potential energy that's stored. So it it's, has significance, it has the potential to provide long-term energy for a lot of applications. So yeah, commercial companies certainly jumped on board probably around like the early 1950s, right? After the Atomic Energy Commission was formed. But initially it was the government. For, and, and we have to acknowledge and recognize it was for military purposes, really for the fear of not having it fall into the hands of um, you know, the Axis powers, right? So, but yes, a great question. Thank you, see, that's how it works. Ask questions, raise your hand. I am so good with all of that. I appreciate you doing that. Okay, we're going to keep going if I don't see any hands come up. So actually, in 1951, at Idaho National Lab, they did just that. So within, what, I don't know, six years, seven years of the, of the end of World War II, they actually built a small little nuclear reactor at Idaho, at the Idaho National Testing Station and were able to generate electricity. Now, admittedly, it wasn't a whole bunch. I mean, four light bulbs, I mean, that's, that's kind of cool, I guess. But okay, all right. We have humble beginnings, right? But, but it worked. It worked. They were able to produce energy. They could spin a turbine and a generator. And look at that. We can, we can power electrical equipment. 
Again, not a lot, a couple of hundred kilowatts, so it's not much, but at least it proved in principle it could be done. And so that was the key. And I would say that is the point at which commercial companies started getting some interest in this, because they're like, well, all we gotta do is scale it up and make reactors bigger, and we can power you know, a large uh, number of com electrical components and equipment. And in fact, that's exactly what they did. Um, now, of course, our friends over in the former Soviet Union were also interested in doing this, and in fact did this. Um, they actually uh, built and constructed the first nuclear power station for civilian purposes, again, in the, Soviet, in the former Soviet Union, um, and again, it wasn't a, a large amount of power, of about five megawatts, five million watts, which sounds like a lot, but it's actually relatively small by today's standards. But again, they were able to prove that it could work, it went online, and it was the, it was the first power station that could produce, uh, I would say, large-scale electricity. Um, our friends in the Navy, not to be outdone, <clears throat> really liked this nuclear technology. Any, can anybody maybe give me a thought on why our friends in the Navy would love the people who drive submarines around under the water? Why would they, why would they want nuclear power? Refueling. Yes, refueling. What did they use before this, before nuclear? What were the old World War II submarines? Diesel. And what do diesel generators need to run? Oil and air, air oxygen, right? When you're underwater, there's not much oxygen down there, unless uh, only what you bring yourself, right? So all of a sudden, they have this power source that doesn't need oxygen and can run for years and years without needing to be refueled. And Admiral Rickover said, I'll take a hundred of those, please, <laughs> right now. And in fact, the US Navy has been one of the most ardent supporters and users of nuclear power in the world. They are absolutely uh, in a class by their own when it comes to operations and nuclear power operations because they found significant advantages with that. And I, I've got several friends, the folks that I graduated with went into the Navy, and they tell me that um, when the nuclear subs go out, the only reason they have to come back is because they run out of food for, this, <laughs> for their crew. Like, in other words, the, the sub could just keep going, you know, almost indefinitely. And they can run for years and years and years without needing to be refueled. They have to, they have to come back because the, the crew gets hungry, right? So th that's a nice energy source when you can do that, when the people are the things that are the most limiting. So the Navy was all over this. They love nuclear power. Um, a few years later, in shipping port, uh, Pennsylvania, we did have a, a, a commercial nuclear power plant that was built. It was a pressurized water reactor, 60 megawatts. Uh, so we're starting to see the power levels go up now, right, as the plants get bigger, as they scale them up, we're starting to see these go online commercially, um, and in fact, when we look at, when we look at what was going on from the 60s to the 80s, this was the boom years for, for nuclear power, pretty much after World War II, and like I would say late 50s, all the way through to the early to mid 80s, nuclear plants were going up all over the country, uh, because they were reliable, they were safe, they produced large amounts of power, um, and they could be really used to safely and effectively contribute to what we call the base load capacity for many major cities and metropolitan areas. Now back in the 60s and 70s, nobody was really thinking about greenhouse gas emissions. I hate to say it, but we just weren't. But this source of energy was producing carbon-free electricity even though nobody really recognized the significance of that at the time. They just wanted energy because we were growing. We had come out of World War II. Uh, cities were growing. Uh, automakers were growing. We had the baby boom years. That's me. I'm a baby boomer, in case you're wondering. Right? Baby boom years. Um, and so as the U.S. population increased and the need for energy increased, nuclear was there to really meet that rising need. It leveled off sometime around the 80s. Um, and, um, and it's been relatively flat since then in the U.S. Um, <clears throat> for a number of reasons that we'll, that we'll talk about. Okay, questions? More questions? All right, I'm keeping my eye out for you. So, 1979, this was a, I would say, sort of a watershed moment for the industry. In Pennsylvania, um, <clears throat> there was an event at the Three Mile Island Unit 2 uh, plant. 
where part of the fuel had accidentally melted um, and was contained inside the reactor vessel. So this was an unfortunate event. Um, there were a number of causal factors that I don't have time to go into, um, but it was a combination of, uh, of training and human decisions and some design issues that made it hard for the operators to understand how the plant was supposed to respond in this circumstance. Um, <clears throat> They were able to, all of the, the melted fuel stayed in the reactor vessel, which is where, which is the steel vessel that holds the fuel. Um, there, was, there were some uh, radioactive releases inside the containment, um, but everything essentially stayed inside the plant itself, which, was, which is how they're designed. They're, yeah, yeah, please. Um, well, given that all that happened, and it sounds like it wasn't terrible, why did it cause such a store on people? Mm. In my island is... <coughs> Is, common, is a common story to many people. Yeah, I, I will tell you, so, uh, and I know I'm being recorded, so I have to be careful what I say here. We in the nuclear industry stink at public relations. <laughs> we flat out stink. We'd be fired from, from any public relations office. We did not do a good job communicating the aspects and elements of that event. Um, and we don't want to downplay the significance. Any accident is, is certainly a concern. But we just have historically not done a very good job of communicating the risks and relating them to risks that you're familiar with in everyday life, like getting in a car, riding on a, in an airplane, right? We don't put it in terms that people can understand. And I think that's partly our fault. And I think the other part of it was that nuclear was still relatively unknown to most people in the public. In the 1960s and 70s, no, nobody was doing what we're doing right now, having public forums and discussions. It was just, it was sort of out of the mainstream. People didn't really know much about it. It was this mysterious kind of thing that nobody really understood. Um, and, and that was not good. That, that did not help our cause. So hopefully we're improving by doing things like this today. And that's, that's part of why, why we're here today, why I'm here today to talk about it. So, but yeah, you're right. It, it was, uh, we did not handle the sort of the PR side of that very well at all. So no, I, I would put the blame on the industry there. Yes, yes. Get her a microphone now. <coughs> Wasn't it Eisenhower that had atoms for people? Yes. Why didn't that have a special effect? It had, I think, and by the way, that is a great observation. So the Eisenhower's Atoms for Peace program was really what kicked this off in the in the late 40s, early 50s. Um, but yeah, it 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 kind of went under the blanket after that and the industry took off and people started building plants and it, it sort of fell out of the national you know limelight the visibility um, nuclear scientists were like world renowned in the 40s and 50s today you never hear of them anymore because it's it's sort of a technology that is blended into the background of society um, but the yeah eisenhower's adams for peace program was a significant contributor um, to getting us to where we are today very much so um, so, that's a great question, by the way. Thank you for asking. Yeah, well, I think we got one here. I also thought one of the biggest issues was the spent fuel cost. Oh, we'll get there. Okay. We're coming. <laughs> Don't jump ahead. Let's do it. Okay. Yeah, we got it. We got you coming. We'll keep moving because that is that is a very important thing to, to, to discuss. And we got to be open and, open and transparent about that. Uh, we need to be very clear on that. Um, okay, so uh, we're almost done with the history lesson, so I appreciate you hanging with me. Um, so in, in response to this, the industry launched what's known as the in Institute of Nuclear Power Operations, or INPO, located in Atlanta. What was happening prior to Three Mile Island was utility owners and operators worked in their own space, and they didn't really share information with one another very well. They just kind of did their own thing. And as long as they were good, everybody was happy. After Three Mile Island, the industry started to realize, you know, we got to get the industry together and start sharing best practices, sharing near misses, sharing our lessons learned. Because we don't want somebody at one plant to make a mistake and then six months later, another plant makes the same mistake. And so the safety culture of the industry really changed tremendously with INPO. Um, and people began to share their lessons learned and their operating experience. And so INPO was formed to do that. 
Um, and you can see the mission to promote the highest levels of safety and reliability, promote excellence in the operation of nuclear generating, um, nuclear generating plants. And so every utility, every nuclear plant owner operator today in the US is part of INFO. And I think that's a very good thing because they all share their information so they can learn from one another. Um, and they can start and they can recognize issues if they do come up early on in the process rather than waiting for something bad to occur. Um, and so this was a very positive step forward. Um, unfortunately, our friends in the Soviet Union didn't have such a system in place. And they had a very old reactor um, in 1986. And at the time, it was built in the early 50s. It was of a substantially different design than anything we have in the US. Um, and it was operated in a, in a very unsafe way uh, during a series of testing or tests that were performed. And they wound up having a very severe event um, where, the, where the plant was damaged, the core was melted, and, and it was a significant, significant event that occurred in the industry. Now, I don't know if you, any of you remember from my slide in the beginning with me in my cap and gown, does anybody remember what year I graduated? Hey, look at that, 1986. So this occurred three weeks before I graduated with my degree in nuclear engineering. And I remember my dad telling me, he's like, you're not gonna have to go to Russia, are you? I'm like, no, I am not going to Russia. But yes, it is interesting how these things occur. Um, but this was a significant event, and there were a lot of lessons learned from it. Um, but again, in the US, the, the plants and the fleet um, of plants that we have operate at a very, very high level. Um, we don't have plants that are anywhere near this old or they, these very older designs anymore that are running. Um, and I'll show you some data that I think will help kind of substantiate that. The U.S. nuclear industry fleet has absolutely performed brilliantly over the last 20 or 30 years. Um, we talk about this thing called capacity factor, which is basically the amount of time your power plant is running in a given period, let's say, compared to what it could be running. In other words, for example, if you had a power plant that had a 50% capacity factor, what that would say is it's only running half the time. And the other half of the time you're shut down for maintenance or refueling or some other problem or issue. So if you can get a capacity factor, you know, upwards of 90%, you are doing a fantastic job with it, which means your, your asset is putting energy on the grid 90 plus percent of the time, <clears throat> which is stellar. And in fact, if you look, okay, well, just if you look at, if you look at where the US was in the 19, let's say the early 70s, they were hovering around 50% capacity factor, right, if you can kind of look at it, right? So think about you own a car and 50% of the time it's in the shop getting fixed. That would be a 50% capacity factor. You'd probably be thinking, time for me to get a new car, right? Right. But that's where they were in the, in the early 50s. Look where they are today, north of 90%. Um, the bottom line shows what percentage of total electricity that's generated in the US comes from nuclear. It's about 20%, more or less, about 20%. So the industry has really improved significantly in terms of their operations and their safety. Uh, we've had no major events in decades. Uh, the industry has really done a, a, a very commendable job um, in getting the fleet um, and operating in a very effective and safe manner. Yes, we will talk about the spent fuel, because that is something that is, still needs to be addressed. Um, okay, so that goes with where we are in the present for nuclear. All right, so I'll take a moment just to stop and make sure everybody's okay. Any questions or any thoughts anybody wants to share? Yes. I'll get you a microphone here to see, can we get our microphone? So would it be correct to say that in the, the couple of incidences that, we, that you've identified that are famous around the community, yeah. like power, like Fremont and Chernobyl, yep. there are fewer than 100 deaths documented as associated with those. Incidences. Yes, so yeah. Very, very few deaths. Very, very few deaths, yeah, by comparison. I had a chart, I don't have it with me, but if you look at, it's kind of a strange statistic, but if you look at the number of deaths produced per megawatt hour of electricity generated, if you think about that, so the number of deaths per megawatt hour, 
Um, nuclear is far and away the lowest of any energy source, including wind and solar and geothermal um, and coal. Um, in terms of their safety performance, they are just absolutely at the top, even with those major events notwithstanding, including those. Um, so yeah, yeah, it's, the safety record is really quite impressive of the, in, within the industry itself. So, okay, good. Any other questions? I'm looking, I'm looking. So where are we today? All right, so here's where we are today. So this is a little uh, circular chart of how, how the fuel, the, I mentioned uranium a few minutes ago, so why, why, do we, why do we care about uranium? Well, uranium is what we use as our fuel in the nuclear reactors, uh, but we can't just take it out of the ground and start using it, unfortunately. So there, have, there are a number of process steps starting at the bottom with uranium mining. Uranium a, is a heavy metal, it's just like any other precious metal. It's mined out of the earth, just like gold and silver and copper. Um, you can buy it on the New York Stock Exchange if you want to. It's a commodity, right? Um, and um, it's mined out of the ground. Um, it is enriched. Natural uranium doesn't quite have the exact composition that we need for a power plant, so we have to we have to enrich it a little bit so that it'll work more effectively. Um, and then it goes into a powder form and then eventually it'll go into this little thing called a pellet. And I'll show you a picture of the pellet in a minute. Um, and then it goes in these fuel rods and bundles and then it goes to the power plant to operate. And then when it's done, it'll go to a spent fuel pool, a spent fuel storage, and we'll talk about that. Um, and, and that's where the fuel will sit um, until we get a long-term uh, repository or recycling solution. But we'll talk, about, we'll talk about that. So this is what's going on with our friend uranium. It is not the only um, element that does this, but it's probably the most, one of the most abundant that does this. Um, when, when a neutron will hit the uranium atom under certain conditions, um, it will split the atom and it will release large amounts of energy and it will release other neutrons, and it will release fission products that are the result of that fissioning process. So, number one, large amount of energy. Number two, the neutrons that are produced can keep traveling and cause more fission. That's how you can get a sustained chain reaction if you play your cards right. And, and then the fission products will stay in the fuel, but they are releasing energy, and they're still radioactive, so they need to be contained. But all of the waste for nuclear power stays in the fuel. So unlike, let's say, hydrocarbons, when you combust a hydrocarbon, like, you know, let's say, you know, methane or propane or any hydrocarbon, the, the byproduct, CO2, gets released. Well, here, all of the waste stay in the fuel. So as long as you can safely handle and store the fuel, all of your wastes are taken care of. They're in that very, very small volume of the fuel. And your goal is to keep it in that fuel and make sure it's safe. But there are no gases emitted in, 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 under normal circumstances. There's no gases emitted. There's no greenhouse gases. All of the waste stays contained in that, those pellets, those fuel pellets. So that's an advantage, I think, that nuclear has, for sure, compared to other uh, forms of electricity generation. This is kind of the, the, the road map of what it, of what it looks like. Um, so if you go down to the bottom here, let me make sure I don't. Just, so in the lower left, you'll see there's the uranium atom and the fissioning process that's taking place. All of that takes place inside that tiny little fuel pellet. Fuel pellet is about the size of an eraser on a pencil. So it's not very big. Now there are quite a few of those pellets, those fuel pellets that gets stacked into a rod, and then there's many fuel rods that make a fuel bundle, and then those bundles go in the reactor core, and that's what produces the energy to generate steam, to spin a turbine and a generator, and put electricity on the grid. That's about as simple as we can, uh, I, can, I can explain it. Yes, please. Um, if you don't mind going back. Oh, okay. Where do, we, no, I mean, you don't need to do the slide. Okay. Where do we get, where in the world is there uranium? I don't want to like yep. other things that we can't Yeah, do yeah, it's a great question. I had a slide on that, but I took it out because I didn't want to bore you with those kind of details. So there is, so you all are asking good questions. So actually, the United States is one of, has uranium as its natural resource 
uh, were only second behind, second or third behind Australia and Kazakhstan. In other words, uranium is very, very predominant in our geologic makeup in the U.S. We're kind of like, we're sort of like the Saudi Arabia of oil when it comes to uranium. We have a lot of uranium in this country. Now, of course, Kazakhstan and Russia also has a lot, and Australia actually has a lot, which is interesting. Um, but there are places in the world that don't have uranium as a natural resource, and China is one of those. They, are, they have almost no naturally occurring uranium. They had to bring all their uranium into the country. So it's actually a very interesting question when you look at it from a, an energy security standpoint. Nuclear is actually a very friendly energy source for us here in the U.S. We have a lot of uranium in the U.S. Um, compared to a lot of other countries. Um, and again, it's mined out of the ground. We have open pit mines out in Wyoming and out in the Midwest. And it's, it's abundant in the U.S. Canada also has a lot of, of uranium as well. It's a natural resource in Canada as well. So the North, I would say the North American continent is actually quite uranium rich. So that certainly works in our favor. Um, and again, you've got, you know, as I said, the fissioning, you've got the fuel pellet. And then that picture in the middle at the bottom, that's actually what a fuel bundle looks like. Um, and it's about 12 or 13 feet tall, so quite heavy, quite tall. Um, there are several hundred of those that go in that reactor core um, at any one time. And again, um, tip, and I have a slide on this later, but uh, fuel will run several years um, in the reactor before it has to be shut down to refuel. Um, so it can run for an extended amount of time. Not as long as the Navy, but still can run for multiple years um, without needing to be refueled. Okay, any questions on this? I know this is a pretty busy slide, but any questions on, on what it looks like, all the, all the magic that goes on behind the scenes? Okay. Uh, oh, yeah, question. Yeah. <clears throat> How many of these cells are there in the reaction? It depends on the size of the plant. Uh, the smaller ones can have 300. 350, the larger ones can be up upwards of 8, 850 or more. So, of course, plant sizes do vary, um, but for the type of reactor we're talking here, you can have as many as 800 or more. It's a lot of fuel, a lot of uranium in that core. Yeah, yeah, a question? Yeah, we got one here. Oh, one here. question about the body of uranium. Yes. Is there any risk to it? And does it um, uh, it, like any material that is mined out of the ground, it has to be done so carefully. Um, there are no immediate hazards or risks um, beyond what you have in mining any other metal. Um, so you can't, this chain reaction cannot happen while you're mining the uranium because it's, it's in a form that it, it, and, and at a level that it, would never, it could never sustain a chain reaction. But it still has to be handled carefully and safely, just like any other metal that you would mine at the ground. So, yeah. We have one there and one here. Oh, she's coming. She's coming here. Oh, no, there you go. There you go. Yeah. Okay. Same question. Uh, regarding oh, oh. enrichment. Yeah. There you go. Regarding enrichment, uh, if you were a chef, I'd say you'd add butter. What are you adding? So you're actually not adding. Great question. You're actually not adding. Um, you are um, removing a certain uranium isotope that doesn't fission, and you're preserving the one that does. Um, so the uranium-235 is the one that we want, because that's the one that undergoes the most of the fission. And so naturally occurring, most uranium is actually the, the kind we don't want, strangely enough. Um, it's it's uranium-238, but we'll enrich it slightly in U-235, only to about 5% or so. That's all we really need um, to, to get what we want. So, but it's but it's it's a, it's an expensive process. It does take time uh, with our current technologies. So, yeah. Okay. What you don't use is that dangerous. What we don't use for the when when you're enriching. What you don't use. Yeah. So the so what we don't use. No. It's again. It's not dangerous in the sense that it can't do this chain reaction thing. Um, and you do have to store it safely. You have to make sure it's. Because it is it is slightly radioactive, um, but it's but it's not a it's not a significant hazard. Um, uranium by itself is naturally occurring, um, is is has slight radioactivity to it, but it's not anything that is significant, um, not a significant hazard. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I have two questions related to this bit, dual rods. Okay. One, one is that uh, I've heard that there's technology being developed potentially to recycle them. I actually.
actually do have a slide on that. Oh, All right, so I got one right. <laughs> Yeah. That's correct. You've done your homework. You have definitely done your homework. So one of the thing about about spent fuel is all the waste stay in those little fuel pellets. The volume of waste is actually very very small. And I've got a chart to show you the waste volume for nuclear compared to other like municipal waste or medical waste. And it is a fraction of the volume. And in fact, you're right, um, all of the spent fuel in the entire country could be contained in a building the size of a football field, um, one or two stories high. So it's not a lot of volume. Now, it is still radioactive, so we can't just throw it out. But, but if you could get it in a storage facility that would be safe, it wouldn't take up a lot of space. Um, by volume, it's actually quite small. Yeah. Yeah. That could be a security threat. It can. That's why we're they're looking at like the geologic repository or recycling. Yep. Yeah. So I mean, I could see terrorists, somebody dropping a bomb, call them up. Yep. It's got to be secured and protected. Now, one of the things about spent nuclear fuel is that it is highly radioactive. So you can't just walk in, grab a fuel bundle, and run out because you probably won't make it very far because they are very radioactive. So they are what we call self-protecting in that they protect themselves because you can't really steal it. But to your point, somebody could try to, uh, let's say a terrorist attack perhaps, could um, cause some damage. And so yes, it has to be secured. Um, and the fuel that's on the sites today is very well protected and very well secured for that reason. Um, because we want to make sure nothing happens to it. Yeah, that's a good question. Yeah, very good question. Okay, good. All right, y'all, we're getting into the Q and A here. I like it. It's, you're definitely doing good with the questions. Okay, more questions. Okay. Yeah. yeah, please. If you were to rank the resources in the United States getting from nuclear, solar, etc., where would you rank that? So, uh, at, at the risk of getting some pushback from my colleagues, I think we, I don't think there's going to be any one answer, there's not going to be any one solution that's going to do all of what we need. I think it's going to take a combined effect of renewables, solar, wind, geothermal, nuclear. I think nuclear is certainly, if we wanted to put money into that, that would be one to, to look at. But I don't think it's going to solve all the problems. I think it's going to have to be a combination of energy sources. And, and I don't know that you want to put all your eggs in one basket for energy security reasons. Right, um, because like, what if what if the metals that we need to make solar panels all of a sudden aren't available anymore, or are owned by a, another country that's not favorable to us? Now, now we're kind of held hostage, right? So having a diversity of energy supply, I think, is good. And I think you can identify four or five and put your put your resources there. I think that's that's the, would be the right way to do it. And uh, and the U.S. government is doing that um, in a number of areas, including nuclear. Um, funding the development of advanced nuclear is one of the ways that, we're, that the government is encouraging that and wanting to do that. So, yeah, it's a good question. Uh, one of the big advantages, of course, of nuclear is the fact that it's 24 7 continuous supply of energy. <coughs> we, in this area, do need to be particularly interested because Duke Power is considering uh, replacing the coal power plant at Blues Creek, uh, which is just down the road from here. Yeah. Um, I just wonder if you would comment. I mean, uh, clearly, from a retired physician, from my point of view, the amount of air pollution, and uh, people don't realize the amount of damage that's been done to lungs of all of our population by the coal uh, plants and yeah. emissions. But, um, yeah. Uh, yeah, I've got a slide on that that'll show sort of the how nuclear stacks up against other energy sources for reliability as well as for emissions. But yeah. Yeah, I think it's it's more than just a, a climate change concern. I think it's also a pretty significant health concern as well. So I think there's a lot of reasons why we need to go with far more carbon-free, carbon-neutral, you know, energy sources. Yeah, that one here. I think it's got a let me get a microphone. Future of fusion. Um, well, so I'll tell you. When I was in school 30 years ago, it was a decade away. And from what I can tell, I'm still being told it's a decade away. Now, there's a lot of promise in fusion. There really is. 
There's still a lot of technical hurdles and challenges with it. Um, I would love to see something, I'd love to see a breakthrough occur to get there, um, but I don't know that we can wait around uh, as, long, as long as we would need to to do that, but I would love to see it. Um, but it is a completely different technology than what we're describing here. Um, and the temperatures that those systems operate at are astronomical compared to what we're talking about here. So materials and material issues are always a problem um, and always a challenge. But, um, but yeah, I, I think it, 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 I would love to see it happen. Uh, but it's still, it's still probably some time away. So, yeah. Okay, that's a great question. Yeah, another one back here. Wait. Yes, please. Where does the cooling process fit into yeah, that? Yeah, seems like that is right here. I think I literally think that is my next slide. Well, actually, here you can kind of see it on uh, the bottom right. You can kind of see where the water is being pumped. You see where it says feed water pump at the bottom, and then you have the reactor core. That's what's cooling those nuclear fuel rods, um, and and generating the steam. So that's the liquid water that's cooling the fuel, producing the steam, and then the steam goes through this turbine, the steam turbine, to spin it and cause what, produce electricity. So the water that's in that system is all self-contained. It's just boiled, you spin a turbine, it's, it's liquefied, it's condensed, and then it's pumped right back again. So it's a, it's a closed system. Um, and the turbine spinning then puts, spins the generator and, and produces electricity. So the water here would be considered the coolant. Um, as well as the, the working fluid to transfer the energy to the turbine by, by steam. Yeah. yeah, good question, very good question. Now we will talk about, there are some of the uh, newer reactors that don't use water as a coolant. Some of the more advanced technologies actually use other materials, and we'll get to that, but today most of these reactors use water as a coolant. Uh, but some of the more advanced ones that we're looking at use some al alternative materials that are kind of interesting. And we can discuss that. So I'm glad this animation works, because this kind of shows, I don't know how well you can see it, but you can see the water, this, the water being pumped from the condenser back to the, the, the nuclear reactor at the, on the far left. And you can see it coming in, it comes in the bottom, it gets heated by the, the nuclear fuel, their steam is produced, steam goes out the reactor vessel over to the turbine, the turbine spins, puts electricity on the grid, and then the water is brought back to a liquid state. It's it's back to liquid, and then it's pumped right back again into the reactor. So it's an entirely closed system, um, and um, when it's running, and which is 90 plus percent of the time, since they have very good capacity factors, you're putting electricity on the grid, you're putting energy on the grid. Um, and that's what we wanted to do. Um, again, I put some information down here at the bottom. Most of the power plants today are quite large, thousands and thousands of megawatts of power. And again, that was because of the booming years that I showed you before. There was a, there was a real need for energy production and consumption in the 60s, 70s, 80s as the industry, as our, as our economy was growing. So most of these reactors are quite large. Several thousand megawatts, you can see hundreds, six to 800 fuel assemblies, a lot, a lot of uranium. Um, most of them run about every two years and then they shut down for refueling roughly. Um, and then they will replace part of the fuel in the core um, and then shuffle the rest and then put some new fuel in and then button it up and operate for two more years. Um, and so, and fuel typically goes about three cycles. So each fuel can be used for about six years, roughly. Uh, after that, it's depleted to the point that it, 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 it gets taken out of service. But fuel lasts quite a while. It lasts quite a few years and they get quite a, a bit of energy out of it. Um, and as I said, a large number of fuel assemblies in each reactor. Yes. You got a microphone there? Yeah, I got a slide on that. Yeah, yeah. So North Carolina, woohoo, is way above the national average when it comes to nuclear energy and the fraction that it uh, contributes to the state's energy needs. Although we are running behind South Carolina. South Carolina is like 55% nuclear. So I, get, I do have a slide on that, and I'll show that in a minute. But yet nationwide, it's about 20% across the whole US. Um, but the Southeast is way above the average. Um, and, uh, and North Carolina is as well. Okay. All right, um, so here's the, what we call the power of the pellet. So um, 
This is the, oh, I think it's in the front pouch. Flop it over, it's in the front pouch. Yeah. So there's your uranium pellet right there in that green circle. That little pellet, and again, it's about the size of a pencil eraser, right, roughly. That contains the equivalent amount of energy of, to roughly about one ton of coal, um, about 150 gallons of fuel oil, and some 17,000 cubic feet of natural gas. So there is a massive amount of energy in that one tiny little pellet. Um, and now remember, there are thousands and thousands and tens of thousands of these in the entire nuclear reactor. Right? So there is an enormous amount of energy available inside that, inside that nuclear fuel. Um, and it, it is significant. I mean, it can produce a tremendous amount of energy um, over, a, over a long duration of time. These are the capacity factors for the different energy sources, source types. Um, and you can kind of see, starting at the bottom, solar, wind. And remember, capacity factor is the amount of time it's running compared to the, time it, uh, the total amount of time it could be. So a 50% capacity factor means it's, it's only running about half the time, right? So when you look, nuclear is way at the top, far and away higher than most other energy sources. Any, any thoughts on why wind and solar would be so low? Yeah, it's not always sunny. And the wind isn't always blowing, right? Oh, you got it? Yeah. yeah. OK, all right, we're having trouble with our laser pointers today. Not sure what's happening there. Oh, I got it. It just had it. I just saw it. Oh, you know what? Maybe it's because the screen is so far away. Because look, I can see it down here. Yeah. <laughs> Wow. Okay, there it is. All right, you have to like hold it right there, don't you? So again, nuclear is way up here, but yeah, wind and solar quite low, right? Because again, they're more affected by the weather, right? Nuclear totally unaffected by the weather. We don't care if it's raining, sunny, windy, cloudy. It doesn't matter to us. So a lot of um, value here for nuclear in terms of its ability to stay online and run continuously compared to other energy sources. So that's, uh, that's a plus. Um, this is what nuclear looks like. Now this is the US, okay? When you look at all the clean energy sources in the US, so ones that do not produce any greenhouse gases, you'll see nuclear is far and away. It, it represents about half of the total energy uh, for, from, for, for the US, uh, basically as much as wind and hydro, solar, and geothermal combined. It's about half of all of the green energy um, that is provided in the U.S. And again, this is about 19% of the total. Uh, obviously, the other percentages are fossil fuels, right, which we're, which we're trying to replace and trying to uh, pull away from. But again, nuclear is really has been a very strong contributor to the, to the energy portfolio for the U.S. for quite some time. Okay, here's the one I promised you. So here's the percentage um, uh, electricity from nuclear in the southeast. So here we are, North Carolina. At last count, we were about about 33 uh, percent. There's South Carolina; they are way out there. Um, but even when you look at the five-state average, 37 percent. That's still well above the national average of about 19 to 20. So the southeast um, is really, um, I would say, probably compared to most areas, is really out of the lead uh, when it comes to energy independence. Um, and, and carbon, you know, carbon-free uh, nuclear production. Um, Tennessee also has quite a bit too, with 45 percent. Oh no, I hit the black screen. Don't hit the black screen. There you go. Um, so, in addition to energy supply, there's also a very big financial impact of nuclear, um, both in the southeast and in North Carolina. Um, these came from a report generated very recently by E4 Carolinas, which looks at all energy um, portfolio, all the whole spectrum of energy production in the Southeast and in North Carolina. Um, but you can see significant tax revenue, uh, jobs, economic impact are very, very significant. So it's a big player in, in, in the economy as well as the North Carolina as well as the Southeast. Yes, got a question. What is the... Uh, <laughs> What's the environmental cost of building and maintaining? I mean, that, that's a trade-off you have to address. It is. Yep, no, good, 
question. So um, in terms of environmental cost and impact to build, um, it's essentially like building any other power plant. So it, it, it would be the same as building, uh, you know, let's say a coal, let's just use coal as an example. You're still going to need the same equipment, you're going to need the same, you're going to need concrete, you're going to need steel, you're going to need a turbine and a generator, you're going to need a structure, a building. Um, so there's not a significant difference in terms of uh, impact when it comes to the environment, in terms of building the structure. Now you will have to transport the nuclear fuel to the site, uh, but again, that cost is minimal and there should be no environmental impact to that. Um, so uh, by and large, it shouldn't be significantly different um, in terms of construction of the site. Where most of the cost is tied up in nuclear is um, in safety and regulatory uh, efforts because we are a very heavily regulated industry, which is understandable. Um, and we do, like, like the FAA regulates airline travel for good reason, um, there are industries that are more heavily regulated than others. Um, and so nuclear is one of those, so that, that does add to our cost when it comes to putting up uh, a new plant. But in terms of environmental, it should be pretty comparable to any other type of energy, any energy, any energy source. Yeah. yeah, good question. Yeah. I have a question. You don't have to go back to the slide. Okay. But it shows that 51% of our, of our clean energy was from um, nuclear In France, it's my understanding yeah. that France generates quite a bit of their um, energy from nuclear. Yeah. What is the percentages there? Um, and what are the cost comparisons for the consumer in France versus the United States? I don't have the cost consumer comparison, but in France, it's about 80% of the total amount of energy is nuclear. So not just the green or, or carbon free, but total amount of energy is, is nuclear. So they have a very, very strong presence and produce a lot of electricity. So much so that they're selling it to other countries in Europe who don't have a lot of nuclear, like Germany, for example, uh, where they, they have to. Can they? Do they mine it in France, or are they getting it their uranium from? They they'll get it from other sources. They do have mining there. Um, it's, I don't know that it's as much of a natural resource there as it is here. Uh, but they've got the infrastructure to be able to recover it, enrich it, and use it. And yeah, they're very, very uh, heavily involved and heavily used nuclear. Yeah, it's about 80% of their energy supply. You never hear of um, any, any brownouts or blackouts in France. They, they have abundant, abundant energy there, for sure. Yeah. yeah, great question. Really, really good question. Okay, good. Any more questions before we move on? I don't want to... Keep you here longer than I, I need to, but you're asking such great questions. Okay, so this is what North and South Carolina look like. And you can see that we've got nuclear plants all around us, actually. So let me start at the bottom here. So we've got a plant that's very close to, um, I'm going to use my own mountain clicker. We've got, we got the plant that's very close to where I live, which is the Brunswick Nuclear Station. It's a two unit station down uh, in Southport, which is not too far from where we live, um, and then we've got a number of plants here along the top. Harris, the Harris plant near Raleigh, that's a one-unit station. We got McGuire, that's a two-unit station. Catawba, Oconee is actually a three-unit station. There's actually three power plants at Oconee, um, and then Robinson uh, has one as well. So, uh, if my math is correct, um, there's North Carolina has five, South Carolina has six. So 11 total, and that, card, that, that accounts for the 37% of total energy from nuclear. Um, so you can tell that the Carolinas are very, are very rich in nuclear power. Um, and, and I think that's one of the reasons why we, we're seeing the economic growth that we are in this part of the country. Any questions on this? Because I know maybe, I don't know if you were all aware of all the plants that have been around us for many years operating safely. Um, but they have been there and have been very effective. We, do, we used to supply fuel to the Brunswick plant, but they went with another fuel supplier, so hopefully we'll get to that one day. Um, here's North Carolina, so like I said, we got five. Um, and um, two at Brunswick, Harris, and then two at McGuire. 84%, 32% um, uh, of the total um, electricity generated and 84% of carbon-free electricity in the state comes from these. 
That's a lot. That, that is a lot. So when we look at it, I know the question has come up. And so let's talk about the waste issue. This is an important one to address. It, it really is. So today, uh, all the nuclear plants in the U.S. will store their fuel in spent fuel, or what we call a used fuel, pool underwater, under a large amount of water. They're safe, they're, they're cool, they're contained, and, and there's no risk. They've been operating like that for many years, storing fuel. Now, that was not the ultimate plan for this used fuel, and I'll get to the next slide. I'll explain a little bit of what happened, why we're continuing to store the fuel uh, in these used fuel, fuel pools. Um, there is, I'll mention that there are a few utilities now that are going to this dry cask storage. Um, some of the fuel is so old um, and it has decayed so much that it doesn't even need to be water cooled anymore. And they can store, store it dry in a dry cask and it can just be air cooled. Um, so it, it's not a, a, an intractable problem. Um, a number of years ago, there was a, a speaker that came um, that gave us, uh, that talked to us about this. And as I said before, um, one of the advantages of nuclear is that all of the waste is contained in the fuel rods and in those fuel pellets. So there's no, no waste that's released. Everything stays in that fuel, in that fuel pellet, in that fuel rod. Um, the, the, to the initial toxicity or the radioactivity decreases pretty rapidly. Um, after the first few months, um, it, it decays significantly. Um, it, it doesn't require a tremendous amount of radiation, a few feet, a few feet of water or a few feet of earth will do it. And the volume of waste, as I mentioned before, is actually quite small compared to other waste forms. And so I'm going to show this to you because I promised I would show you this. So this is what the comparison looks like, waste volume comparison. So at the top is nuclear waste, what we call used fuel or high, high level waste. Uh, generate about 2,500 tons a year that, that come out of the reactors and go into pools. But if you compare that to uh, other forms of municipal or governmental waste by volume, nuclear is a fraction of the volume uh, of almost all other waste forms. I had no idea there was that much cattle waste generated in the United States when I first saw this. That's astonishing. But in terms of volume, You've got volume is a big factor when it comes to waste, getting rid of waste. If it takes up a lot of volume, that's kind of a problem because you've got to find a place to put all that waste, right? So one of the advantages nuclear has is that the volume is incredibly small by comparison. And so if we can find a place to store it or recycle it, reprocess it, um, the volume is really not a concern. Again, it has radioactivity in it, but in terms of dealing with the waste by volume, it's actually very, very small. Um, and so for us, this is not a, we would say not an intractable problem. Now, what happened? Okay, a little bit of history here. Um, there were plans, uh, there had been plans for many years for a deep, what's called a deep geologic repository. Um, a site in Nevada was selected in the early 2000s to be the place for the deep geologic repository um, for used fuel very safe, very well contained, far away from everybody. Um, there were a number of, of legislative actions that were taken, the Department of Energy submitted an application to construct the repository. Um, it ran into some political challenges. Uh, the Obama administration uh, essentially halted the project because of political pressure. Um, the NRC reviewed the application and found that it was acceptable, but the project had been stalled, um, uh, just for data sake, data point sake. The Trump administration wanted to reinitiate this, to go back to this idea of a deep geologic repository, but the House and the Senate couldn't agree on what, on exactly what to do, so it stalled. The Biden administration uh, does not necessarily support a deep geologic repository. They're more in line with wanting to do like a centralized, consolidated interim storage. So it's, there have been, unfortunately, political disagreements and, and disagreements on how to handle the fuel. Obviously, ultimately, a solution would be needed. Um, but right now, and in the meantime, uh, plants have been storing this fuel at their site for decades upon decades upon decades without issue, without a problem. It's obviously not a long-term solution, but 
it is something that we'll, we hope will eventually come to fruition, but um, we didn't really solve until we get some sort of the, the, the political and governmental will behind it to want to actually take some action and go forward. Um, but that's where we stand right now, at least on the waste issue. Any questions on, on this? Because I know this is probably a topic that some of you have been thinking about. Yeah, we got to see one in the back here. Well, because eventually these plants are going to shut down, and you got to do something with it. I mean, you, I, so it's kind of a two-edged sword. On one hand, perhaps one of the reasons why we can't seem to get any political motivation behind it is because nobody really views it as a risk, because it's being stored safely on these sites for decades and decades. If it were a real risk, something would probably happen. Like people would actually start putting money and effort to it. But because they don't really see it as a big risk, it's not really getting any forward traction. But eventually, there's going to have to be a solution. Yeah, eventually, there's got to be a solution. Um, but unfortunately, it's just not moving forward like we would want it to. Yeah, yeah, good question. Yeah. How long is this process going to take? So, the good question um, the spontaneous decay will happen for many, many years. Oh, I'll repeat the question. Yeah, please. Go ahead so you can hear it. Sorry, yeah. Oh, so how would you ask how long is the spontaneous decay? Is that what you asked? How long? So yeah, I think it was on my other slide here. Let me go back to my slide here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Spontaneously decays. Um, so it will decay for many, many years because some of the products that are produced are very long lived. I mean, thousands, tens of thousands of years. But they are getting low levels of radiation, but they're going to be radioactive for a long time. So that's why we can't just not do anything. Ultimately, we've got to have a solution. Um, but the initial activity, the initial uh, toxicity decreases very rapidly um, after the first year, couple of years. Um, but it will always be radioactive. There's always going to be some spontaneous decay. Um, yes, good question. Yes? Yes. So one of the things that's being proposed, and I think we had a question about this too here. Yeah, um, so vitrification or re recycling or reprocessing. So one of the things that's being proposed, and again, this is just what uh, ideas that some, uh, a few companies have come up with, um, that there could be a way to look at recycling the spent fuel. Now one of the things about spent fuel is that it, can t it still contains a lot of really useful materials in it that if you can isolate and separate and recycle, could be put back into the fuel cycle itself. Um, and so there are at least concepts on the board for technologies that can recycle this spent fuel. Let me get my pointer here, make sure it's working. Yeah, I gotta line it up here. And you kind of lose it on the screen. But down here at the bottom where it says spent fuel, um, a technology which will take advantage of being able to recycle that fuel, put it in a very special nuclear reactor that can that can burn certain isotopes that are long lived, um, put electricity on the grid, and then put the usable uranium back into the fuel cycle. It'll still generate some small amount of waste that has to go to the geologic repository up top, but the volume will be significantly less. Um, and so there are technologies that are being considered that could ultimately do this. They've not been commercialized yet. Um, they're still in the development stage. Um, but there are possible solutions other than just sticking it in the ground, um, which are being looked at. Yeah. Yeah, we're, we're running over time. Okay, I'm sorry. That's, that's okay. It's, yeah. We're, I think everybody's probably going to stay a little bit longer. I would like to sneak in a question. And Please. We just have a few more after that. Uh, and that is, my biggest criticism I see being raised about the industry in general has been cost overruns and expense, yeah. uh, which is a concern for all of us yep. who are paying. You bet. Yep. So that's where we look at the future. Well, it's like, almost set me up beautifully here. So one of the things that's happening now in the nuclear industry is in the past we had these very, very large, massive power plants that produced thousands and thousands of megawatts. Well, things are starting to change. And when we look to the future, we're looking for smaller, modular, less cost, less cost intensive, more reasonably priced, that can be put on the grid more rapidly. 
The big problems with nuclear have been large cost overruns and then time delays in getting the plant built. So the goal is, can we get smaller, modular nuclear reactors that can be built in a more uh, modularized or production form and they can be dispatched to the site and, and assembled quickly and put up within a few years, not 20 years, right, to save the construction costs. So that's where things are headed for, yeah, oh yeah, go ahead. That's where things are headed for um, the nuclear industry in the future. Yeah, yeah there you go. Um, so this is where we were in the past. So right now we are in what we would call the generation three power plants. That's the, these big ones right here, these advanced light water reactors. This, that's where we are right now, this middle group. We are moving now very rapidly towards what we call Gen 3 plus. These are the small modular reactors that still use water as a coolant, but they're much smaller, considerably smaller, and with, with the goal of being able to put them on the grid, design them, license them, build them, and get them on the grid faster um, so that they don't have huge cost of and then we'll talk a little bit about these generation four. These are the really the next, next generation. These are the small modular that don't use water, that use something other than water. So let me go through this quickly because this is really, I think, the, the, really the purpose of why we got together today, one of the purposes. So the Gen 3 reactors are the large, very big gigawatt scale reactors um, that have active safety and cooling systems. The Gen 3 Plus, this is the ones, these would be the S small modular reactors that we are looking at today that have all inherent and passive safety systems. So they don't need any operator action. They cool themselves naturally and passively, uh, which is a big advantage from a safety perspective. Um, and they are generally of less than about 300 megawatt electric, so a fraction of what the older ones were. They're considerably smaller, but they're also passively safe and inherently safe, and can also be deployed rapidly to the field. Um, and so let me kind of show a little bit about what these look like. Keep switching clickers here. So these are the small modular reactors. I didn't label the companies, but um, there is one on there with a the name on it. But these are reactors that are now, rather than being thousands and thousands of megawatts, these are on the order of a few hundred megawatts, roughly about 300 megawatt electric, compared to the ones that are out there today, which are a thousand or more. Um, they're modular, the idea being they can be fabricated and manufactured and assembled on site. They take advantage of modular design and construction. Um, and they can be grouped together um, if you need, if you really need more power, you can put two or three of them. If you don't need all that power, you can just put one up and they, they wouldn't take as long and um, that you would need to build a full-scale plant. So this is how they're grouped. So the light water reactor, SMRs, are the ones in blue. And then there are some more advanced, what we call Gen 4 reactors, that don't use water, but use other things like gas or liquid sodium or molten salt. Um, those are really more of the advanced Gen 4 reactors, guys, that are still on the drawing board in, in, a, lot of, in a lot of places. So why would we want SMRs compared to the old big plants? There are really a number of very compelling reasons why SMRs are what we think are, are, are going to be very effective in the future. Um, if, if things go according to schedule and according to plan, we will be able to avoid the high cost and long time of building those older, larger plants that require a lot of effort and have, have, have been at risk of construction delays um, and overruns. Um, and if you can construct and design and modularize the construction, um, it ought to be able to be deployed quickly and easily, much more easily. Um, a couple of the things that a lot of people don't think about is that with the retiring coal plants, and we do have quite a few of those, of the fossil fuel plants, most of those run at power levels that are like on the order of a few hundred megawatts. And so these small modular reactors are really good as replacement energy for retiring fossil plants. Because if there's a 300 megawatt fossil plant that you're shutting down, well, we could just replace it with a 300 megawatt nuclear plant. We don't have to put a big thousand megawatt plant there, just replace it with something else that's about the same size. Um, 
SMRs are also very complementary to wind and solar because wind and solar have lower capacity factors, like we learned today, right? Nuclear has a much higher capacity factor. When the wind is not blowing, the sun's not shining, um, nuclear can help offset those times when the renewables are not on the grid because it can run steady state at, at 90 plus capacity factor. And so it does present a lot of advantages um, to be able to complement the existing infrastructure, the energy infrastructure. And the goal being to get it on the grid much sooner and at much less cost. Um, and again, if you need more power, if you need more energy, you can, you can have multiple smaller units. Um, so it's really cost driven, but also um, but also regulatory driven as well. So yes, question. Okay, what role does ESG play? Yeah, what role does AI play? That is actually a really great question. One of the things we're doing with these SMRs is we are, it's kind of interesting to, to think about this. What we're doing today is building what's known as digital twins. So if there's a power plant that is being designed and put on the grid, there will be a complete numerical digital twin that simulates everything that goes on in that plant. And the data will be collected and used, and AI and machine learning will be used to trend and track the performance of the plant. And so over time, if they start to notice that there's, let's say, a degraded, a degraded performance on a valve or a pump, they'll be able to track it and say, hey, you know what, the pump's gonna need to be replaced within the next six months, right? Preventive maintenance, um, data analytics. So yes, actually AI is gonna play a big role. Machine learning and, and, and artificial intelligence are gonna be a big part of this. And as we, as we build out these digital twins to go with the actual physical plant as well. So we're trying to leverage that. Yep, yep. Very, very good question. Yeah, what else? Was there one over here? Nick, we better make this the last question. Okay, yeah, that's All right. Um, in North Carolina, South Carolina, it seems like we have a corporation that pretty much controls all of our energy um, for private use. With this technology enabled, the ability to build smaller plants. Mm -hmm. Do you see other uh, corporations coming in and maybe squash this monopoly? I mean, I, I think I'm pretty sure I'm pretty sure you are all reading. My, are you sure you didn't get a copy of my slides ahead of time? So there are a bunch of companies. In fact, when I pulled this information down, I was actually shocked myself. I didn't realize there were this many companies in the U in, in, in the world doing development of small modular reactors. A large number of, of, of companies that are developing next generation SMR technology. Now, of course, you can see in the US, there's quite a few over here. In the US, we tend to be bi-coastal. We, we're, either, we're either all on like the East Coast here or we're all on the West Coast. Not a whole lot going on in the middle of the country when it comes to um, the development of next gen technology. Uh, but there are a number of companies that are working in this space. The other ones I will point out to you that may be of interest to you. Does anybody know what CNNC is, given its location on the map? Right there. China National Nuclear Laboratory. Oh yeah, they're dead serious about this. And they are very active in SMR development. As is Rosatom right up here at the top, which is Russia. Many, many nations are interested in this for the same reasons we are. Energy security, energy independence, any energy grid reliability. So yes, there are a lot of players today that weren't around 30, 40 years ago in the industry. Now these are the, these are the SMR developers. So these will be the ones that sell the plants or the technology to a utility. Um, to use, right? So the, the utilities themselves will likely still be in place, but the technologies and the companies that provide that technology will, will likely be varied. And there are quite a few very good companies in the U.S. Um, that have great products that they're developing that should be available um, in the next five to 10 years. So the goal here, I think, is to be able to get that energy reliability and independence, right? To have technologies that we can use. But no, I don't think it will address the concern you had about the utility itself. Uh, although you never know, because there are times now when we're starting to hear about micro grids and small energy grids, 
um, that could be independent. Um, one of the things that's really cool, I don't know if I have it on my slide here. Yeah, this is a really cool area right now. So there are small modular reactors, and then there are actually things that are called very small modular reactors or micro reactors. They are extremely small by comparison. They're only on the order of typically a few megawatts, which is not much, but they have some really unique characteristics in that they can be deployed rapidly, they can be transported off on the bed of a truck, on the back of a truck. Um, our friends in the Defense Department are very interested in these, as you can imagine. So is NASA for deep space exploration or for lunar or Mars colonization. These are very small reactors, but again, there's no reason these types of micro reactors couldn't be deployed um, with small micro grid areas for certain parts of the country. In fact, there are companies in Canada and in the northern part of Alaska that want to set up their own little energy grid for, let's say, remote mining operations, because they don't want to have to transport diesel fuel across Canadian tundra of thousands of miles or ship it on boat. Um, and so these hold a lot of potential too here for application in the future. Um, these small micro reactors and micro grid technology. These are still a few years away, um, but it's, it's rapidly developing. And many of the companies I showed you on that global map that are working on SMRs are also working on these DSMRs as well. But they're still, uh, still a few years away. Um, okay, so we're going to wrap it up here. So, again, I won't spend a lot of time on this, but when you, when you ch chart out what the SMR market would look like over the next, let's say, 30 years, 35 years, you see that there's a significant contribution it can give uh, to reducing uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, the goal is to get to that install capacity where you, you get sort of a levelized amount so that there's, we're not increasing uh, carbon footprint at all. It's kind of once once the um, once the fossil fuels come offline and, and everything is running that is carbon neutral, we hope to be able to levelize that out. This I think actually shows it pretty well. It's sort of a cartoonish picture, picture. but you can kind of see over here that um, up until a few years ago we were continuing to increase our carbon emissions, but now they're starting to come down as fossil fuels are coming off the grid. So this is an opportunity for nuclear and others to, to move into this space with replacement energy. And then hopefully, if we hit the window of net zero by 2050, which that's the goal we're shooting for, we can maintain uh, going forward with some of the more advanced SMRs and advanced reactor technology. So that's ultimately the goal, is to get to the 2050, net zero 2050, which by the way is not just a US goal. Canada has the same goal, many countries have have that same goal. Okay, so this is what it might look like. This is what the estimates are saying. So if the numbers are true, we're, we got a long way to go to get to the point where nuclear can, is going to be able to meet the demand. Uh, the, the, the illustration I like to give is, imagine every automobile on every road in the United States being an electric car. That's a pretty cool thought, isn't it? Now, Think about where's all the energy going to come from to charge those tens, hundreds of millions of cars. That's a problem. Because I really hope we're not going to rely on fossil fuels to charge our electric vehicles. Right? So we've got to have carbon neutral energy to charge all of these EVs. As we move toward that electric economy, that is going to be absolutely key. It's going to be absolutely key. And that's why I think the question that came earlier, where should we invest our money? I think the answer is everywhere. Whether it's wind, solar, geothermal, nuclear, it's gonna require everything we have to be able to meet this demand. And I do think nuclear is part of that for sure. Um, and again, the goal, the estimates are we're gonna to have to quadruple by 2050. And that, uh, from what I've read, that's a conservative estimate. It could be more than that. So it's gonna require a lot. It's gonna require a lot of effort to get to that point. Um, but I think it's doable. I think we, we are more doable. Okay, you survived me for an